So I'm excited to start a series today on prayer. One of my favorite things to do. I love to talk about prayer, and it's so great that our practitioner prayer partners are here because that's a huge part of what they do on behalf of uh, our church themselves and our world and the people that they work with is prayer. And so it's really important, I think, to stop every once in a while and really look at what, what is this thing called prayer? Why do we do it? What does it bring to us in our lives? And so it's a perfect synchronistic moment that we're going to really do some powerful prayer work together today. But it's a two-part series, and so it's called Prayer Power. And uh, they've created a beautiful graphic for us, which you probably saw from the, the wonderful marketing team here. And today is part one, prayer, what it is. And so we're going to, to really talk about the overarching philosophy of prayer that we have here in our community in Science of Mind and Spirit, because it's a little bit different than um, you might have experienced before if you've never been a part of this community, or even if you are part of this community, you might wonder, why is it that they pray so strangely? There, there's a, a, a lot, there's a, a marketing slogan we have here with our logo you might have seen that's different here, right? Well, today what I'm saying is prayer is different here. <laughs> We're using that philosophy, that whole notion that we do things rather differently here. And this is one of the ways that we are different than many, many communities across the globe, many faith traditions. And the primary reason that it's different here about prayer has to do with the basic undergirding notion of our teaching. So in much of the world's traditions, there is a fervent belief that that which is the creator or God or by whatever name they call it, exists out somewhere in the cosmos. By and large, although this wasn't always so, we have evolved this concept in the current culture of planet Earth to largely be a guy in the sky, often resembling Santa Claus with a white long beard who doles out blessings and curses to those he likes and those he doesn't. And our, our Judeo-Christian Bible that a lot of the Western world who uh, aligns themselves with Christianity studies uh, seems to support that notion, especially the Old Testament. The books of the Old Testament are very difficult to read sometimes because that God seems like a pretty angry, judgmental dude who just, uh, you know, throws curses out upon humanity every time he's upset with them. And so that can seem really challenging for us. And Jesus, in the in the, 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 the New Testament, in the Gospels, came and his whole teaching was he literally said, I'm setting aside the old Gospels, that old notion, those old prophecies, and telling you that God is love. I'm telling you, I'm bringing a new covenant to humanity that indicates that the God that exists is a loving God who loves all and actually is right within all of us, expressing through us and as us, and said many times to those gospels that this light, this presence is not some far off being out there, but indeed is something right here. And in those 2,000 plus years since he walked this earth, and he certainly was not the first or the last prophet to suggest that this was the, the true place of the divine, humanity has often struggled with our relationship with this thing called God. For if we believe that God is out there, then when we pray to it, to him, we have to convince him to do our bidding. We have to somehow convince him that our cause for ourself or for another or for the world is worthy of him taking some time out and saying, okay, you've been uh, faithful enough, good enough, uh, I will grant your wish, like the genie in the Aladdin's lamp or something like that. And so that can seem so disempowering to us. And therefore, if we believe in that God out there, we often practice what I call the three Bs. 
uh, begging, bargaining, and beseeching. <laughs> we fall into a trap. Uh, I feel like it's often um, when I've been there, because I certainly have, it's the same feeling I used to get with my parents when I was young and I wanted something and I would either beg them, please, I've been so good and I've been so, I've been so wonderful, can't you just let me have this thing I want? Or I'd bargain, I'll do dishes for, for, uh, for the whole rest of the year if you'll give me what I want or I would beseech, which is the, the demanding, hey, I want this, you have to give this to me. And sometimes we approach God in that way. So when that is our worldview, that becomes our approach to prayer. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's still many people who approach prayer that way. And if it serves them and that's what feels best to them, then of course I bless that. In our teaching, however, in the science of mind and spirit, we have a completely different notion of who and what God is, and therefore that informs how we pray to that God. We have this sense of not begging and bargaining and beseeching. And in fact, uh, there's a, a, a story in the synoptic study of the teachings of unity that, that quotes an amusing article that appeared in the London Express where George Bernard Shaw says, lots of people pray for me and I have never been any worse for it. The only valued argument against the practice is that God knows his own business without any prompting. Obviously, Shaw is alluding to the common type of prayer which occupies itself with praying for this and for that, intimating that God could not run its universe without our help. Any prayer that beseeches and begs God to do a thing is an open acknowledgement that the creation is incomplete and that the creator has forgotten or overlooked something that is very necessary. The more we beg God to be good, the more we show forth our ignorance of its eternal nature. So that's what we understand in our teaching and how we practice. Because while I can say that that way of praying isn't wrong or bad, it's not my way of praying anymore at all. Because I have come to feel and experience and believe fervently that it's not the most effective way to pray. It's just simply not the most effective way to be in that beautiful process of connecting with the divine. So we believe in this teaching that the God that exists is not some far off guy in the sky, but is a being that is transcendent of gender, is neither a he nor a she, is a presence that is infused within all of creation and is surrendering itself continuously to all beings everywhere. And that's why we sing that beautiful song, Use Me, O God, because we use it and it uses us for expression and that we are always in the co-creative nature of the divine presence. In fact, those of you who've heard me talk about prayer before, you've probably heard me say that really in terms of the philosophy of prayer as we teach it, we're always in a state of prayer. We are always in a state of prayer because we are always launching forth our thoughts, our ideas, our energy, our attitudes, our emotions, our intentions. We are constantly in the process of that energy of molding and, and fashioning and forming our consciousness, ourselves, to what we think about, what we worry about, what we, what we affirm about, what we, we get positive about, to what we are upset about. We are constantly allowing this source to pour through us us in that creative nature. So prayer for us is an ongoing practice. However, there are times, like with practitioners and ministers and people who practice this teaching, when we stop and we enter the prayer process formally as a methodology to form and fashion and align in a way that works for us to the good that we seek and that we desire so that we use that energy that's already pouring through us consciously. We use it consciously. We wake up to it and we say, well, gosh, if it's pouring through me and creating through me all the time, then how about if I stop and take a moment to get into connecting, conscious connection with it and consciously 
allow it to form and fashion itself in some direction or another. This is our form of prayer, commonly called treatment or spiritual mind treatment, because we recognize what has been said for ages that when we pray, we don't do anything to God. We don't change God. We don't convince God. We don't uh, somehow magically cause God to go, oh, okay, I get it now. She wants that, okay. But we do change ourselves. And by changing ourselves, by changing and shifting and molding and moving and healing and, and allowing ourselves to be in that beautiful surrendered place, we become then an instrument through which God, the creative source and force of this universe, can express itself maybe in a new way that it never has. And we see the results of that in our world as we do every day of our lives, whether we ever pray formally or not. But if we want to be consciously a part of that co-creative nature, we allow ourselves to step into it in that way. So to talk about prayer, give it a, a context today, I have taken a page out of the Dr. Roger Teal acronym universe. I worked hard on this acronym, weeks on this acronym, looking at the the many, many words that could go along with my acronym. And my acronym is P-R-A-Y today. Pray. As a way to help us and maybe to help those who are seeking to continue to evolve their prayer practice, to remember what prayer does, what it is. And so the first word of prayer is powerfully. Powerfully. I want to talk about our power. So if this is our methodology of praying and this is our, our belief about the nature of the universe, then what we have to accept is that our true power is something possibly different than many of us were taught and than many of us practice more often sometimes than not. See, we've been told that our truest power, and we may have come to believe that our truest power is our ability to manipulate matter to get things and people and conditions to change because we talk to them, we move them around, we put them back where we want them, or we force them, or we push them, or we get them, or we, we do whatever we think we need to do that makes us feel power because it's very easy to see that if I want to move this stand, I have the ability to fire off the synapses in my brain that fires off the muscles that cause me to be able to move it. It may take me years to be able to look at it and make it move. I get it. I believe that that's possible. I will say that's, that's my woo-woo-ness. I do believe someday that may be possible for humanity. But that's a whole other talk altogether. <laughs> right now, what we're talking about is our truest power really lives within our ability to sense the divine power that is the truth of us to sense that activity that is within us at the depth of our being that is constantly moving through us, to sense the highest aspect of ourselves, to sense the power and the presence of God as us. Therefore, we teach people how to not only pray, but to meditate on an ongoing basis to reattune ourselves to that true power. Otherwise, we're constantly being seduced by the world of form. We're constantly being pulled around by the nose by the world of form. We're constantly believing that what's possible or not possible is all about what we're seeing out there, rather than allowing ourselves to have a relationship that is just as, if not more profoundly, attuned to this inner realm such that we know that from this place, anything is possible. From this place, true power, the power that is not aggressive and forceful, but the power that is filled with the grace that God is, the power that is filled with the light and the love and the wholeness is our truest power. And the more we begin to attune to that and trust in that, the more we feel empowered to move through our life and to use the power of prayer for ourselves, for each other, and for our world. And the more we begin to trust that true power. So it's powerfully allowing ourselves to own that. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says, 
the spirit responds to us by corresponding to our states of thought. We enter into it in such degree as we comprehend it. It enters into us through correspondence is as in such degree as we comprehend it. Prayer, communion with the spirit, meditation or contemplation is for the purpose of unifying our minds with the universal mind, opening up the avenues of our thought to a greater influx. So this willingness to surrender into our true power allows us to feel a greater alignment and leads us into the next part of our acronym, the R. It reconnects us. It reconnects us to our true power. And so praying uh, invites us to be faithful to the use of it, even when it's hard or it doesn't make sense. We become faithful to prayer. We become some of those people who, who are faithful prayers. Some of us struggle because we have more faith in what we see in the world of form than this right here. And our teaching, and I believe that spirituality at its core, across the board in every faith tradition, is an invitation to say, what will you have faith in? Will you have faith in all that, or will you have faith in this? And sometimes it's hard because we just want what we want when we want it. Years ago, Dr. Patty and I were at, in Los Angeles for uh, some, we were in the School of Ministry together. We were students, she was a year ahead of me, and we were, we were exploring a church in Los Angeles called the Founders Church. It was the church that Dr. Ernest Holmes, our founder, joined with William H. D. Hornaday to form one of the first big churches that they built. Literally, they built the congregation and they, they built the building. And it's a beautiful building that still exists. Founders Church is still in Los Angeles. And so Dr. Patty and I were exploring founders one day. In fact, we were, you know, budding ministers. We were happy to be budding ministers. And so we took pictures of each other standing at the lectern at Founders, smiling. So it was sort of an affirmation of, we'll be ministers standing in a, in a wonderful church someday too. And we happened to run into, Ernest Holmes, of course, was long gone. He passed away in 1960, but William Hornaday, Bill Hornaday, was still there. And Hornaday invited us into his office, which was Ernest Holmes' office at one point. It was kind of like Mecca, going home. It was really exciting. And so we're there, and I could feel the presence of Ernest Holmes in this office. And Bill was, was regaling us with stories. Things like there was this little alcove off of the office that had three big trees. And I mentioned something about the beautiful trees. And he said, you know, Holmes planted those. Ernest planted those trees. And the gardeners told him over and over again that the trees would not grow there. They were not, that was not a good place for them. But you, he said, you could see Ernest out there every day just praying lovingly over these trees and here they are years later big thick trunks and he told a story on himself he said one day he had a, he had a shortfall in his money and he went to Ernest and sat down at, a, at the desk in that office and said to him I'd like a hundred dollar advance on my paycheck and Ernest said no he said I will not give you the hundred dollars bill but I'll tell you what I'll do I'll pray with you to get the hundred dollars and Bill said he was not happy with that solution because he wanted the money. And so he said, no, just give me the money. I know you've got it, Ernest Holmes. And Ernest says, I, I don't care if I've got it. We are going to demonstrate the power of prayer. So we're going to pray together. Let's pray. And Bill said he kind of rolled his eyes, but okay, let him do his stupid prayer thing. Fine, fine, whatever. And so Holmes did this beautiful prayer. And as soon as the prayer was over, he said, and so it is. They opened their eyes and Bill said, okay, now you're going to give me the hundred dollars? And Holmes said, Bill, no, I'm not going to give you the hundred dollars. And pretty soon there was a knock on the door. And their secretary came in and said, hey, we've got a couple here. They would like to get married in the chapel downstairs and they would like Ernest to do it. And they need a witness. So Bill, could you come be the witness? And so Bill's begrudgingly said, fine, I will go. So they go down to the chapel. And as they're talking to this couple, Ernest says, you know, I would love to be the witness and hear Bill do the ceremony. Would you be okay with Bill doing the ceremony? And 
the couple said, well, and Bill said he really rolled his eyes because he just wanted $100. He did not want to do a wedding that day. But he said, fine, fine. And so they did the wedding. Everything was beautiful and lovely. And as the couple left, they were all hugging. And they handed Bill an envelope, and he put it in his pocket. And he followed Ernest back to his office, and they sat down. And he said, now, I want to talk about this $100. When can you give me my $100? And he said, Ernest just looked at him and said, Bill, take a look at what's in that envelope. And of course... He pulled out the envelope, and there was $100 in the envelope that the couple had given him for the wedding. And he said it was one of those moments where he realized he stupidly was in his ego, wanting what he wanted, and wasn't reconnecting with his spirit. But Holmes, even in a little thing like that, was willing to put his faith in prayer. So I invite us to think about where is it that we're pounding on life? I want what I want when I want it and not surrendering into that deeper place to reconnect. Once we reconnect, the A word in our prayer acronym is amplifies. Because the more we, we reconnect, the more our beliefs and our thoughts and our consciousness and our energy is amplified in our lives. The way we practice prayer is this organic process. It's this organic allowing that which is already here to become amplified. And the more we know about it, the more it expresses through us. Ernest Holmes used to say that trained thought is more powerful than untrained thought. And by that he meant that those of us who go back to the well over and over and over and over and over and over and over again amplify our conscious sense of that reconnection such that we use it. That's what these practitioner prayer partners do. That's what we're all charged as an ecclesiastical group, as, as ministers and practitioners. We are charged to more than anything in our lives go back to that well and allow the amplification of that divine life to have its way through us so that we can be a beneficial prayer presence to others in our lives. Holmes says then we, we allow our beliefs to become stronger and stronger. And he says, what is belief? It's a mental state. Therefore, we are correct when we say that if we can change the mental state, we can change the outward form. That is where many people make a mistake. Our philosophy is not one of denying the reality of the external, but of affirming the reality of the invisible as the creator of the external. It is the belief and not the prayer that permits the miracle. But the belief could not permit the miracle unless there were an intelligence operating as law which, which reacts to that belief. So we amplify our ability to manifest our beliefs. And lastly, the why? Yours. Powerfully reconnect and amplify what is yours. What is ours? What is mine? I struggled with this one a bit because while I have this fervent belief in prayer, passionate belief in prayer, if you can't tell, I can acknowledge that in my life and in our life together, sometimes it appears as though what I think should be happening, my prayers don't get answered the way I would like them to be. And in fact, I think this is a lot of why in most faith traditions, any faith traditions, people abandon prayer. Because there's a persistent use of it that is about, well, if I pray, then everything will change. And if, if it didn't change, then I either must have done it wrong, or there's something wrong with me, my consciousness is flawed, or God doesn't like me. That seems to be the prevalent explanation we might have when, when we don't get what we want. But in a recent meditation, I was sensing very deeply how the part of me that thinks it knows what it wants is usually associated with the ego aspect of myself. What we know about the brain and the mind is that the ego aspect of ourselves is about 5 to 10% of who we really are in terms of our consciousness. That may seem woo-woo to some of us, like, yeah, that's, but that's measurable, we know that our brains, our conscious awareness is being utilized by about 5 to 10% of our brain. What about the other 90 to 95% of it? 
What's that? It's the long-term memory. It's, it's, it's aspects of ourselves we have yet to even really realize. And here in our teaching, we believe that that other 90 to 95% of us is the, the aspect of us that is the higher self, the eternal self, the, the self that has always been and shall always be, the seat of our own memory of our eternal experience and the aspect of us that is connected to the all that is. And that what I want with this small mind sometimes isn't able to take into account what's going on at the soul level, soul choices. And then I had this vision of us like a bubble, like a little bubble that's the consciousness and the big bubble that's the bigger aspect of us with this filter in between that represents the unhealed past or the, the, uh, the, the unconscious or the pain, or the trauma, or the, some call it the shadow side. The aspects of us that have blocked out the truth of who we are. So from the place of our ego, we want what we want when we want it. But all the while, this higher aspect of us is attempting to chip away at that separation that we've placed between ourselves and our highest aspect. And if we're doing our healing work in the realm of our humanity, we're chipping away at it from that end too. And when we're chipping away powerfully and profoundly and the light can get through, often that's when we see the most miraculous manifestations. And if we're chipping away at it, we can see that there are times when that which I think I want is not in alignment with my highest good. And therefore, it can't happen and won't happen because it's coming from this small aspect of myself. And there are times when what I, I want to have happen from this higher realm, which could also include my life purpose, uh, it could include my soul's journey in terms of the soul's desire, what I intend to do with this lifetime. And as it has its way through me, this part of me might feel overwhelmed and scared, but can say, oh gosh, I'm getting kind of a vision of what I should be doing. And there's a deep listening. And so our work in prayer often begins at the level of chipping away at the pain and the suffering that we've experienced. To, to do our work in prayer life and to our work in our classes and, and with our practitioner prayer partners and our therapists and everything that we utilize to heal that band of darkness that each one of us has from the challenges and the traumas and the perceptions and the disappointments and the betrayals and the hurt so that we can utilize the truth of our prayer power to contribute to our life in the world so that we can hear the highest ideals for ourselves in living out this life and stop resisting the truth of who we are so that we can be the fullness of ourselves in this lifetime. And so our prayer life, while it might start out as we begin to use it with what we joke about principles, parking, pa parking spots and palaces, might ultimately become... I'm seeking to be the highest version of myself today. I'm seeking to surrender my perceptions about the drama and trauma in my life. I'm seeking to be a beneficial presence for the good of humanity. Because I recognize that as I look out into the world, sometimes what I see that I think is wrong with the world has a greater purpose that I just can't see as I've experienced in my life so many times, as I fervently prayed and prayed and prayed and then went, oh, oh, okay. I'm glad that didn't happen that way because what happened was even better. So we take prayer out of the realm of our small-mindedness, the little one in us that wants what it wants when it wants it. And we allow ourselves to anchor into, I can create the life that I want to create in concert with the wholeness of who and what I am. The big us versus the little us. Dr. Roger talked about that a couple weeks ago. We surrender into the bigger us as we endeavor to live out our greatest intentions and dreams and as we pray, as we pray. Beautiful nun, Sister Joyce Rupp says about prayer in one of her books, the paradox of prayer is that it strengthens us inwardly. As it strengthens us inwardly, it also strengthens us outwardly. 
as we grow spiritually, we become ever more effective catalysts of love in the marketplace. We discover the Holy One within us and the Holy One around us. So this week, I suggest that the dance that we do with prayer is to allow ourselves to chip away at that and to feel the chipping away of our highest self as we come together and powerfully reconnect, amplify what is yours, to feel it, to sense it. We're going to pray now together as we usually do at the end of a talk. We're going to pray, I'm going to pray for all of us to embrace and embody this that I've just suggested. And at some point in the prayer, I'm going to invite our practitioners in the room and our practitioners in training in the room and our practitioners who are watching virtually to stand. You'll hear me say when it's time to stand, please stand. And they will stay standing through the prayer and through the song after the prayer. You might see images if you're watching virtually of them praying. And we are going to pray today. One of our strongest intentions is that before we reopen to pray up this space, to seed this space with the love and the safety and the health and the good that we know is here, to pray up this space so that those who come through the doors and continue to join us in these services continue to feel blessed and they continue to grow. We're going to pray it up real good today and it'll be all ready for us when next week we open. And so